Hello, U.S. History students. So, we have reached the end of Unit 8. Here we are, Lesson 8.8. .8. This is about the Cold War, and that's a topic that we picked up last time. But, of course, last time we were sort of talking about that transition from the end of World War II into the start of the Cold War, and I, I sort of broadly introduced the concepts, the framework of what the Cold War was. Consider that kind of like the Christmas tree, right? I set up the Christmas tree, and today we're hanging all the ornaments on it, right? Today I want to talk about a lot of the individual episodes or individual moments of it. And so for that reason, uh, I, I'll acknowledge that today's lesson is a little bit choppy or episodic, but that's, that's sort of the idea. You have the big picture understanding of the Cold War. Now let's look at some specifics over about a 15-year period of time of how this all shook out. Okay? So our targets today, I can explain the new world order that was established during the Cold War. There really is a a, a whole new shape uh, to the geopolitics in the world um, as a result of the Cold War, and that really looks a lot like today in many ways. And we'll see that kind of start to come into focus. And then we're going to finish this last thought. I can evaluate how we ought to respond to evil and injustice. And and the face of, of injustice has shifted, right? The Nazis or the Imperial Japanese are gone, but there is still this question of, like, there is evil or injustice or wrong in the world, and, and what ought to be our role, all right? Uh, so we'll finish there, and I'm sure that you'll write something about it on, on next week's exam. Let's jump in. This map kind of gives us a snapshot of the moment that the Cold War begins. So consider, again, let's go back to the end of World War II in Europe, right? There's the two sides. There's the Americans and the British uh, uh, coming in from one side, from the west, and there's the Soviets coming in from the east to sort of squeeze down on Nazi Germany. And that line is still kind of there, that, that blue and red side, all right? Because what's happening here is the... Uh, as the Soviet Union has moved through all these Eastern European nations, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, all these, as they've moved through those places, they have liberated them from the Nazis, right? They've removed the Nazis from power, but then they set up new Soviet puppet governments, communist governments in those places, and it becomes clear that the Soviet tanks are not a temporary presence in those places, but they're going to remain parked in those places. As, as Winston Churchill, uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, said in 1946, from the Baltic, that's like the sea at the north of, in, the sea at the north of Europe, from the Baltic to the Adriatic, down by Italy, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals of Central and Eastern Europe. The communist parties, which have been raised to preeminence and power beyond their numbers, are seeking everywhere to obtain totalitarian control. And so we have communist totalitarian systems being set up in all these pink countries. We have nations like Turkey and Greece, which are geographically close to those spots that are suddenly like at risk of takeover uh, by uh, communist uh, parties being aided by the Soviets. And in the West, even though you're spent from war, you're sort of saying, what do we do about this? This is put more simply. This is sometimes how Americans perceived it or remembered it. And of course, we understand this is oversimplified. But there's also something to this, right? And this, again, is the snapshot right at the end of World War II. And the question for the United States is, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? How ought we to respond to evil and injustice? Uh, but it's made very tricky by the fact that we've just gone through World War II. Here is the next set of great decisions facing President Harry Truman, right, who's been in office only for months but again, just like world-shaping events are being set on his plate. So in response to the fact that there's all these countries in Eastern Europe that have been uh, fallen to totalitarian control, where there's, they're being run by communist puppet governments, and it's clear to everybody that the Soviet Union is calling the shots for those places. And as Turkey is trying to resist this from happening, and Greece is trying to resist this, and, and China, oh my gosh, is China going to go communist too? And what does that mean for other places that surround China and East Asia? President Truman announces what's called the Truman Doctrine. All right? It's a policy of containment. And that policy looks like this. If you are a nation, any nation, it doesn't matter the relationship the United States has had with you in the past. It doesn't matter if you are a, a, a critical economic partner to us or, or not. All right? If you are a nation that is struggling to resist communist revolution, the United States will stand to support you. All right? We are the place you can turn to for help. 
And you might say, well, why couldn't someone else do that? And I'd say, who? Ladies and gentlemen, who? In the wake of World War II, who else can do this? There is nobody else in that position. The United States just says, okay, we'll help. We'll help. Are you trying to resist totalitarianism in your country? Then we will help. All right? Here is the Truman Doctrine. NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Note the countries in dark blue here. These are the original NATO nations. These are nations that ally themselves with the United States. The United States organizes this, but it's sort of in, co in cooperation with the, the nations of Western Europe to say, um, if, if one of us faces Soviet aggression, we all will stand up to it. Like, we're sort of trying to pledge mutual defense to one another. And the United States, I want to be clear, is suddenly very, very involved in the affairs of the rest of the world, right? I mean, I, I want you guys to sort of imagine, like, over this map, I still want you to kind of imagine, like, smoldering <laughs> smoke coming up from Europe. That's still the, the case. We're just a couple years out of the war. The United States is sort of, like, trying to rush in and, and rebuild. Because part of the argument that Harry Truman, the president, makes is, like, communist systems, communist revolutions love chaos. Communist revolutions take place in squalor and mire and poverty. So we need to kind of rebuild, right? Because if we don't, this is just like dark, dank corners for cockroaches to hang out in. So the American uh, Marshall Plan, right? $13 billion being spent to rebuild any nation that wants help rebuilding, right? Like we will bring in food, medical supplies, like we'll help rebuild factories, all this stuff. Pay us back later or don't, who cares? The point is we're trying to rebuild you Right? You're going to remember where this help came from, and, you're, and, and it's, the more rebuilt you get, the less sympathetic you become toward sort of the chaos of communist revolutions. This is essentially a, an American-run Western empire that's, that's, that's happening here. All right? um, but, uh, you know, Americans, and certainly I would argue, it's built on humane values. It's not built on resource extraction or something like this. It's built on the idea that, like, Democracy and political liberties are good. They're universally good. They're good everywhere. People are entitled to them. All right? And where people are, are not allowed to make those choices or not allowed to, to have those types of liberties and freedoms, that is bad. And we should stop uh, the, the expansion of systems that take away people's freedoms and liberties. And the way you do that is through strength. You can't, we learned in World War II, you can't like avoid it by putting your head in the sand or just saying, not our problem, or why are we involved in this, right? Like, in the absence of strength, anarchy reigns. They said that was the lesson of the 1930s. And so now we want a robust response. This is going to be very expensive. But Americans and Harry Truman said, but what's the alternative? Consider what's the alternative? Germany is a tricky case, all right? I mean, Germany, of course, is like the center of World War II, and so the question of what happens there is key. And let's just say an agreeable a solution to that question of what should happen to Germany was never found that was perfect <laughs> for everybody. And so what ends up happening is Germany is split up, all right? Um, the portion of Germany that the Soviet Union had sort of uh, moved into and taken control of at the tail end of the war became what we call East Germany. In that portion of Germany... Um, uh, German communist, the German Communist Party was sort of propped up and put in power, and that became a Soviet satellite state, or Soviet puppet state. And this becomes that great experiment that that historian Neil Ferguson talked about, where you take one nation, a nation of, you take one population, one set of resources, and one culture, and one history, you split it up, and you say one half is going to be free and capitalist, one half is going to be, you know, uh, communist, and let's see what plays out here in the 20th century. And the story that's going to get told is that, yeah, the Western half, like, far, far, far surpassed uh, what was experienced in the, in the Eastern half. All right. Um, now, uh, Berlin is a trick. Berlin is the central city in the German economy. It's the capital city. And so Berlin itself was broken into two chunks, right? East Berlin was the was the communist half, and West Berlin is the free democratic half of that city. <laughs> now, the trick is, as you can see in this map, Berlin is entirely contained within East Germany. And so what you had was like one little half city that was free and democratic that is not contiguously connected to West Germany. 
uh, by that weird accident, there was like a window for people in East Germany, in East Berlin. If you want to get out to the West, then sneak your way into West Berlin. And from there, you can take any of the corridors. It's like special controlled highways from West Berlin to West Germany. You can hop on one of those corridors and be out. And once you're in West Germany, you have access to all the political freedoms that you would like. And 3.5 million people did that over the course of about a decade. These people said, I want to work. You know, I want to make money. I'm never going to make real money in a communist system. So they make their way out. This is an obvious embarrassment to the Soviet Union. It's an obvious embarrassment to East Germany. They're eager to like stop the, stop the flow of people out of their system into the West. And so they build the Berlin Wall. That Berlin, I mean, we talk about walls in American society today, and, and there's the Trump Wall or the wall at the border. Uh, the Berlin Wall is an embarrassment uh, to the Soviet legacy. That's not a wall to keep people from coming in. That's a wall to keep people from getting out. And you're saying, no, nobody gets out, right? We're all staying in here. We're all staying in this system. And that wall became a symbol worldwide of like the, the weird ideological clash happening here. This was worldwide. The, the Cold War becomes a hot topic in Asia, right? Uh, China, uh, in the wake of World War II, China, uh, the Chinese Communist Party would take power there. Oh my gosh, that's a huge country, albeit pretty poor in those days, but a huge country that now goes on to the red side. And there is this notion, this, this idea of domino theory that was held by people in the West that like, you know, um, communist revolutions beget more communist revolutions, right? Like once communists have sort of uh, achieved a communist dictatorship in one country and sort of like a totalitarian system is in control there, they don't just sit tight, then they tend to move on to the next place. And that frequently was true. And so domino theory was whenever any domino is about, is like tottering and on the verge of falling, um, in the interest of, of like containing the spread of communism, you have to like race in and stop it and prop it up and prevent that from happening. And so uh, the U.S. and the United Nations and Western powers ends up fighting a war in Korea, which was not a place of any wealth or really geopolitical significance at all, except in this Cold War context. The Korean War today feels, you know, very obscure to many Americans, even though we have, like, living Korean War veterans in our midst. Um, but, of course, like, the longest-lasting legacy of the Korean War is the existence, the continuing existence of South Korea. Um, North Korea, again, remember, the war starts when the communist North Korea is invading South Korea and the United States and allied nations in the United Nations say uh, no. All right? And the fact that South Korea exists today as a shining example of uh, capitalism and democracy um, to contrast with North Korea is a result of American actions in the Korean War. That's part of that legacy. The arms race. Um, one expression of the uh, of the Cold War was this like uh, weapons buildup between the two sides, and this is really horrifying, right? I mean, for a while the United States thought that it was safe and secure because we had this atomic bomb that we used at the end of World War II. But then in 1949, the Soviets unveiled that they have an atomic bomb as well. The U.S. says a few years later, "Well, now we've got a hydrogen bomb, which is a thousand times more destructive than the weapons used at Hiroshima and Nagasaki." And it's like, okay, problem solved, I guess, until a few years later when now the Soviets have a hydrogen bomb too. And, and we're just like this, like racing up to our eyeballs with nuclear um, weapons and missiles and missiles that can deliver a nuclear, a nuclear blow from farther and farther away. And, and what's happening, the, the, the term for this whole buildup eventually became mutually assured destruction. And the idea is a perverse one, but it's just like we've built up so many weapons that now we're actually safer because both sides understand if you push the launch button, the other side will destroy you, right? Pushing, pushing the button to use nuclear weapons means you are committing suicide. And so as long as both sides are being rational, they will never be used, as long as both sides are being rational. The 50s and 60s is really the height of this period of, uh, of atomic fear and atomic paranoia. And maybe it's not paranoia, that's the wrong phrase, because we actually, of course, did have the power to blow up the planet. Um, but, like, American life was sort of marked, the, the, new, the new normal in America was things like 
seeing fallout shelters and bomb shelters and having those things built into schools and built into houses and or even buying things like a, a, a bomb shelter that you can bury in your backyard. Uh, and it, just note that mom still has to make the beds in that. So the patriarchy is alive even in the bomb shelter. But, you know, this, this becomes something that's a day-to-day -day part of American life in a, in a strange way. This arms race wasn't just limited to planet Earth. I mean, why not outer space? I mean, maybe outer space needs to be subject to the Cold War as well. And so there is this escalation into space, and that escalation began in, in uh, one night in 1957 when Americans were able to look in their telescopes in their backyard if they went out at just the right time and they could see a little blinking light up in the sky. And this little blinking light was terrifying. It wasn't really that much bigger than a basketball with an antenna and some blinking lights on it, but what it was was it was the first man-made satellite ever launched into space. I mean, maybe that should be cool, but it's not cool for Americans because the Soviet Union put it into space, right? And that means if they can put a little blinking basketball out into space, then, oh my gosh, what else could they put into outer space? And could they put weapons into space? And could they be putting cameras into space and be looking at us? And the answer, of course, is, you know, all this is pretty normal to us today. Satellites do a lot of that stuff, but, like, this is the first man-made satellite. It's called Sputnik, right? And... For Americans, it was terrifying because it was sort of like, in the arms race, it seemed like maybe we were like a little bit ahead of them, and then they'd catch up, and we're ahead, and then they'd catch up. But now it's like they took a step ahead of us, right? And we'd always been told by, you know, American propaganda that we've got the technological edge in the Soviet Union, and they're way behind us, and now suddenly they're putting stuff up, they're putting basketballs into space, we're crying out loud, and wait a minute, can we put a basketball into space? And the American government's like, well, you know, not, not yet, uh, we're working on that. And Americans say, well, we got to get down to it, right? And so we uh, begin the, what is it, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or commonly known as NASA, all right? And the space race begins. And the space race, of course, will lead us eventually to the moon in 1969, this great moment in American history. But, of course, if we can contextualize this, guys, uh, Neil Armstrong did not set foot on the moon uh, for the sake of science, Right, or at least not science alone. They did not set foot on the moon for the sake of human progress, or at least not human progress alone. The major context of all this is the Cold War. Right? He set foot on the moon because he's an American, for crying out loud, and he's not a Soviet. Right? And, and we beat them to the moon. And a last thought, spies. Um, spying was... Spying is real. <laughs> but uh, spying... The Cold War is like the height of espionage. Probably the height of espionage across history is during the Cold War. All right. The United States establishes the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. The Soviet Union has KGB. All right. We are infiltrating the Soviet system with our spies. They are infiltrating the American system with their spies. Um, the most devastating example of this, these spy networks at work was when the Soviets... Um, stole American atomic secrets. That's how they developed the atomic bomb. The Soviets could not develop that on their own. They stole, uh, they, they got that from spies working within the American State Department. Two of those spies were named Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They were put to the electric chair after they were caught, but there were others involved. Um, and so, uh, like that, that's, it's, there's very, very real fallout, and that's very real stuff. And I'll also say, and we'll look at this in Unit 9, part of what marks American culture at home uh, during this period of time is like a fear of spies or a fear of Soviet spies in our midst. And we, as we will see, that fear got out of hand. Sort of like the fear that led Americans to say, we got to put Japanese Americans in internment camps and all that stuff. The fear of Soviet spies got out of hand. At the same time, there were real Soviet spies and they did real damage. And that's a bit of foreshadowing of where we're going in Unit 9, not the culture of the 1950s and 60s and looking ahead to today. But we're going to stop here for Unit 8. All right? The Cold War is a delicate, complex uh, conflict over a long period of time, fought in a number of modes. Um, but in a number of ways, it has very real consequences and tentacles still alive today. So that's a wrap on Unit 8. Thank you guys for paying attention, and uh, we will talk soon. Take care.